Greetings, Tony Mobley here. We are back. We had a lightning storm last week and it knocked us out. It knocked us out, but we're back. And so I want to say to all of those who tuned in last week and didn't get in, apologize, but it was a mother nature event. So we were out. Uh, this week we're back and it is an exciting night. Uh, there are some things that are happening tonight that I will share with you at the end of this broadcast. But without further ado, I'm just going to share a quick recap of why we're here. So Conversations with Tony Mobley is about conversations with people all over the world. We talk and we get to know each other better. And we throw in a little technology. And so we have um, tonight one of uh, a special guest who is a dear friend of mine who I met through COVID, believe it or not. And he is uh, one of the people who is extremely responsible for the fact that co the conversation with Tony Mobley exists. And so his name, and I, I messed his name up and I've done his, he's named, let me just tell you this, he is named after the Aztec rain god, and I continue to mess his name up. I was in a restaurant in uh, Tampa, Florida, and I asked a Peruvian uh, waiter the correct pronunciation of his name, still messed it up. My sister-in-law put it on a recording and I still messed it up. And so he just allowed me to mess his name up. But before we end tonight, he is going to pronounce his name correctly for all of us to hear. And it'll be recorded on Zoom, YouTube, and all of the and, and conversation with TonyMobley.com. So without further ado, I'm just going to just tell you who my special guest is. His name is Salak Lopez Waterman, and I messed it up, but I'm going to get it. Believe it or not, I'm going to get it. Um, and so before he comes, let me just say this. Conversations with Tony Mobley, as I said, is about having conversations with people worldwide. Um, I've had some challenges in my life, and I'm at a point in my life where I don't want to wait to have conversations with people. I don't want to wait. And so we started this conversation. So Talak Lopez Waterman is my special guest. He is a theatrical lighting director. That's one of the many hats that he actually wears. And tonight we're going to find out about some of the other hats that he wears. And so without further ado, I'm just going to let my friend come in talk to us, give us some general information, and then he's going to provide us with a lab for tonight. And then once we get through with the lab, then we're going to do some questions. And I'm excited to have you all meet my friend, Talak Lopez Waterman. Talak, Hello. thank you so Tony, much for being here. Thank you here. so much for such a wonderful introduction and such a wonderful forum that you've created for all of us to communicate with each other and understand each other and find each other in this time. Um, I, my name is Tlaloc Lopez Waterman. Tlaloc. Tlaloc. <laughs> Tlaloc. <laughs> we'll work on it. We'll work on it a little later. That's not the lab, by the way. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we are, we are, we are going to talk a little bit about, um, about how, uh, one of the first things that, you know, I teach some, some, I have started to teach some courses on lighting design. And one of the first things and most important things that I learned in my graduate education was about, was an aesthetic comp, uh, concept called contrast equals interest. And contrast equals interest was taught to me by my drawing for lighting designers teacher, Salvatore Taglierino. And by the way, drawing for lighting designers is a euphemism for drawing for people who will probably never be able to draw well. 
but it was a very important class for me. And so, um, uh, because he would just repeat that contrast equals interest, contrast equals interest every day. There would be that, those, that phrase would be said to me every day. And then he said, you know, it doesn't have to be a high contrast. It could be the contrast between gray and a little bit lighter gray on a pigeon, or it could be the contrast between um, uh, the uh, shadow and darkness. It could be the contrast between two colors. It could be, you know, but that the human eye and the human experience probably for survival in, in the Ur times is set up to go to the place where there's the most contrast, probably for reasons of seeing reflections in the eyes of predators in, in it at night with very, very little light, you see it, the contrast and your eyes go there and you can decide what to do flight, flight or fight. And so as we have gotten into an aesthetic world, we've, we have figured out, you know, in the design process, how to put contrast where we want it so that we know where to look. So the lab tonight is, um, a bit of an experiment and I'm glad there's a few people on the panel, but I want you all to un to, to be, feel free on the panel to each one of you. I'd like each one of you to go around and find with the in gallery view where the point of the most contrast is and, 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 and where did your eye go? And then we might talk about a few people uh, individually um, uh, as well. But um, Aaron, I would like to, to, to see, did you, did you have that experience? The point of most contrast experience? Yeah. yeah, yeah so you. if you look at the, okay, so why is yeah. that? I think it's because there is a, I think it's because you're, you're so separate from your background and your face is, there's a fall off there. And uh, yeah, I think for me, that's, what I would always kind of gravitate to it. it and then, and then you look, there's another... look like a human, <laughs> not like an image. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> this, is a, this is a good, good start. That you're a human. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the next thing, the next thing I'd like for you to do, and we're going to keep going around the room because this is, this is an important lab, but the other trick here is if you can't figure out, cause there's a lot going on. There's all, there's all these different people and you know, you might, your contrast, but the other trick is to, is to squint your eyes and find where if, if everything goes a little bit blurry and I want everybody on YouTube to do this, I want everybody to, 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 to play along and, and, and then figure out if, if Aaron is right. And, um, and then, and so John, what do you think? Uh, for me, I, I, I looked at, I have it set over here off to my side on an iPad so I can watch in addition to having other screens in front of me. And the first thing I was drawn to was Todd. Uh, Todd <laughs> is very sharply defined. He's got good separation, but immediately after that, I went down to Chris because Chris has that really nice, bright background. And that was the second thing that pulled my eye. So I think that on my display, Todd's right in the middle of the, of the squares. And that was, one of our first laid in, that was where it went to because that's where your eye naturally lands is right in the center. And then it starts seeking attention and it went to Chris and then it went to Mark. And that's the, and then, and, 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 and then it started you, wandering around. Did you feel like that, that was the reason the contrast was the reason that your eye did that? Did you have to uh, think about it or was it, or was I, it an automatic thing? It was an automatic thing. It was, uh, so I do photography as a hobby. And so I know that high contrast is one of those things that works. Um, but also I get attracted to lighter objects more than darker objects, at least personally, right. that's how I work. And that's why I think I went to Chris next because he has the most pure white. Um, and then Mark has the second most pure white. And that's why I right. went that order. And the so, and so what right John is talking about there is looking at the, holistic picture and finding the thing that pops out most. What we're going to do shortly, I do want to get through some more people to, to talk about this, but we, I want to pop out, for example, uh, Mark, 
because Mark actually has less contrast overall. There's a, there's a flatter look to it. But once we, if it, I'll have each one of you pin him, um, and then on, on YouTube, you guys will see, you'll see him come, come up, but you can see that there's contrast there as well. And so I want to, you to watch your eyes to figure out where, where you look in a situation where there's less contrast than, than in, in the panel. Um, Mark, what, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are um, the most contrast I saw right away was Roscoe's uh, because the hair color up front and then the background over his left shoulder being so dark. So I saw that his, he stood way out in front of the background to me. And did you, did you start to look for something that stood out when I started talking about contrast equals interest or did that happen to you immediately when you were looking at it was, the panel, it was, it was after you mentioned to look okay. for. It. it was not immediate. And 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 you'll never be the same again. I promise. No, no, <laughs> never. Contrasting <laughs> contrast equal interest will be in your head from now on. Uh, how about you, Todd? It's <clears throat> so cool to see how we each see so differently. That's amazing. That's exactly um, right right yeah. it's 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 so yeah. cool so when you so i was totally primed by the contrast equals interest i also do a little bit of amateur uh photography which is fun um so i have i have some idea about that um but i was really drawn to john pewitt's because well he was also in the center of my screen but that blue light is the most interesting thing on the screen for me is the blue light behind his head. And that blue light feels so pure to me in some way, I heard the word pure used, so I'm using it too. Uh, it's so pure. And then the black and red, then against John's skin and that beautiful head. And it's just like, it's just, <laughs> it, it's just re he really stands out in front of his background, but the blue just kind of captures my entire attention. And that's, so that's so that. Yeah. So as we move forward, I want everybody to just what what I, what the thing that I'm doing to you that will that will never be the same is to watch what your eyes do. Figure out where your eyes go and why. And and as you start to do that, you can look at what at at the images you create and the framing that you set up for yourselves and you know on Zoom calls or whatever it is you're doing, even taking photographs. And you'll realize that those things matter. On Todd's, on Todd's shot, there are two points of contrast. There are actually three points of contrast. There are the two, the two lights behind him, and then there's his face. And so, you know, what we may do is, is ask him to pull those back a little bit to pull him forward, or maybe not, because the whole, the whole thing, the whole image as a whole is, is, has contrast to everyone else because no one else except for maybe me, I've got one light behind me has practical lights like that. So then there's contrast in meaning, not just contrast in what you're seeing. So bear that in mind because contrast equals interest. Tony. Absolutely. So uh, as you, you mentioned, Todd, I was going to say that he was what I focused on first when I looked at everyone. And it's interesting that, that, the lights are not the same, but yet you focus on them both. Um, they I, they look like they're they're different types of lights, but they are they 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 pull you in. They they really do, and so it's a nice contrast with with his face. And so, um, wow, thank you, Jeff. I was also drawn immediately to Todd and it was the, the, the warm background, um, really inviting. And then the, the subtle intricacies of all the colors in his shirt that like, you know, that kind of really like frames his face so nicely that all the way around. But I, I will point out that, that, that if every single one of us looked exactly like Todd Reynolds in terms of the color and, and, and the information coming to us, where would we look? And it, right. it wouldn't. I was just thinking about that. Like, yeah. if, if we all looked the same, we wouldn't look, we, there'd be no contrast anymore. Yeah. Right. Great. Um, Chris. 
I wanted to say two things. One is um, all of us, I think, have been um, influenced by Alex Lindsay's preferences for a gray or neutral background. And uh, until earlier this week, um, I've often had a kind of a domestic scene behind me like Todd's does. But I've all, always felt like I was being transgressive. I was resisting the authority <laughs> of uh, the one best choice for office hours and uh, avoiding sessions that were the merciless critiques. Um, Could we cut to Chris, please, while he, he talks? Because I think there's some interesting insight here. Keep going. So that, that's one common factor that we have in our background and our shared experience that um, there's been... Uh, authoritative advocacy for the kinds of backgrounds that Mark has and, and that Aaron has and so forth. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that, um, that contrast isn't the only influence on my, where my eyes went, uh, because I knew all of you people from prior connection. And, uh, so I was, drawn to Jeff Francis because I hadn't seen him in a long time. He's been busy uh, keeping the University of South Carolina out of jail. And so he hasn't been on the same office hours calls as I have. I will have. point out, Chris, that that is as well contrast. You are Interesting. contrasting your not having seen him with your having seen him. Right. But it's a psychological one more than a physiological one is, is my point that, right. you know, I'm, I want to quote unquote, catch up with my friend whom I've been separated from for a while. So it wasn't so much that I was um, operating strict. If, if all of you had been strangers, then I wouldn't have had that um, opportunity to use uh, familiarity and reunion and so forth as uh, as variables uh, overriding the uh, the visual contrast. That's right. the end of my comment. Very cool. And um, did anybody else want to comment on on the panel? Um, I I um, I'd like to look at at Mark's image in a second, and then we'll 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 draw the lab to to a close soon here. But um, I hope that everybody everybody will never see the, the world the same again was my intention. <laughs> and you succeeded. <laughs> um, Marty, you wanted to say something? Go ahead, Marty. Yeah. So I was drawn to John's image for his color contrast. Um, but then I was drawn to Tony's image. Um, for the contrast between his dark skin, his black chair, and his white shirt and white background. So, and, 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 and the other thing is that as we start to understand this concept, we can use it in different ways. And there is um, an incredible amount of contrast in a pigeon, even though it's mostly gray. So if, you, if you're looking at just the pigeon and you start to see the differences between those grays and you'll, you'll, you'll realize that your eye will go to those points of, of, of transition. Same thing is in a snowy field. Once your eye comes, comes once your, your aperture closes down, you get yourself, you get the exposure right, you will start to pick out the things in that, in that snow that are, that are contrasted. It's, it's a very natural thing, and we should know about it when we're making an aesthetic image for people to look at. Um, if, you, uh, if you look, let's look for a quick second at Mark's image because, um, because there's, a lot of the same, it's, there's a lot of the same tonality, value tonality. But see how once we see this in full screen, we know exactly where to look at his eyes or, you know, in, in my case, I would look at his eyes. Why is that? Because it's contrasting, it's, you know, it's contrasting to, to the rest of the values in, in the image. And so watch what you're over the next week. Do me a favor. Watch what you're 
watch what you're what you're looking at and uh if if the idea or the words contrast equals interest do not float through your head, you can come back for your money. Money back guarantee. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, John, you, you had a question? Uh, I'm more of a comment. You mentioned looking at him in the eyes. The, I'm one of the people that don't look in people's eyes. Um, I see a face. I look at your face. I don't, I, I look, to, a lot of people think I have maintain eye contact. I don't. And it's, it's, there's a, you know, there are people that are on certain, you know, neural atypical. I have ADD. I don't know if that's the cause of it or something else, but um, I have to force myself to look at people's eyes. And, you know, just wanted to point that out that not everybody does the same stuff all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very important point that you bring up. Um, and it's also part of this lab because I wanted to point out that everybody has a different reaction to these sorts of things and, um, and that we, that we see things for different reasons, but there is this fundamental underlying idea of what our minds do, which is to look for those points of transition. Aaron, I'll let you wrap this up, but you never told us what you saw. Uh, I see my camera. <laughs> it's right in the middle of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I appreciate you guys taking that journey with me, and I would love to hear some feedback from those that that are um, watching and uh, and those that are here um, to see if 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 it's if it's adjusted your 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 view of the world at all. Yes, fantastic. <clears throat> yes, can I give you some feedback? Yeah. Also, also, I just don't love to say. I mean, I'm I'm kind of watching the chat really closely tonight. So, if anybody has anything to say about that lab, that'd be really fun to for you to bring that up and for us to share it with the panel. I'd be happy to happy to say it. But yeah, the uh, I just knocked the lights back a little bit, Flawlock. Uh, I, I I didn't take my shirt off because that would be weird. But <laughs> um, but I know the shirt is busy. And and uh, Mason Lancaster said Todd has the busiest and most intriguing composition. So so like in music, when I hear that my music's too busy, it's like I get that. I hear that. So it's like <laughs> I I understand that the shirt can kind of fill up the space. But uh, thanks. I I learned a lot from that, Flawlock. Just yeah. And you turned your your two lights down. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I feel like you, I feel like you have actually popped forward uh, a bit and in your, in your, in your image. And so that's the, that's the work that we're doing. You know, we, in, in some situations we, we need to, to review our imagery that we're looking at very critically and figure out how to make it look really good for certain situations. That's not what this is about. This is about understanding what it is that we actually see and understanding what it is that it, how it, it, it comes into us and how we think about it and what, why, why is it that that happens? There are some other fundamental concepts that are like that, but you have to take the class for that. But anyway, um, uh, it's all you, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. To luck. Uh... <laughs> Well, one of the highlights of this conversation is going to be the person who's going to be doing the questions, and that is Mr. Todd Reynolds. And before he he does uh, before he does the questions, I'm just going to ask him to um, to just share a little bit about himself, since I made a special effort to have him do the question tonight because I knew that that would make my good friend happy that he was doing the questions. <laughs> you are so kind, Tony. I, well, first of all, hello to everybody on the panel. Hello to everybody attending. Warm greetings. What Tony, Tony asked, asked me to ask, ask the questions, questions tonight, tonight, I was, I was honored, honored for a lot, a lot of, of reasons. reasons. One, One is, is that I love asking, asking questions, questions and, and I, I love emceeing and I love Clark and I love Tony and everybody in this panel is kind of mean a whole, mean a whole lot to me. So um, I will say that about myself. 
Um, and also to say that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Tlaloc happened through town to light an entire production. And I got to see that production and see his brilliance in it. And most importantly, Isabel, my lovely partner and myself, we got to hang out with Tlaloc under umbrellas as <laughs> it poured down rain from the sky during a concert from a dear New York friend of mine. So that's that's my most, most you know, I've gotten to meet Tlaloc in person and he is imminently huggable and just one of the most lovely people that I that I know. So uh, I think that I'll, I'll let that go, Tony, if that's okay to that's keep okay. it there. And, uh, and, and tell me, this is the first time I've ever been on your show, uh, Tony, to ask questions or otherwise. And I'd love for you to tell me exactly what to do. I'll be happy to do it. Just Okay, so, so now what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at the questions and we we don't have the ability to vote down questions. We can only vote up questions. And so you can look at the questions that are in the Q&A and you make a decision based on the voting, which questions you ask. And Fantastic. if you can see questions on YouTube, feel free to bring them in as you see fit. And so the process is I'll say next question. And you go to the next question. Right on. That sounds good to me. So we'll start out with uh, with a question. And would you like me to read the names of the uh, of the contributors? Sure. Fantastic. So John Pewitt asks to Tlaloc, what has been the biggest challenge for theater this past year or so? And maybe Tlaloc wants to give a little context of his uh, of his theater career. Yeah, so I am a, I'm a, I began as a lighting designer and then was also uh, uh, interested in film for a long time. And then I moved into combining my lighting design with my the, with my film interest uh, in projection design. And I do also a little bit of theatrical of theatrical scenic design. I do not do any costume design. Um, and uh, and I. Uh, for about two months, well, we, we were we were doing shows um, in Florida, my wife and I, and both were canceled uh, as the COVID pandemic began because, you know, we were learning things incredibly quickly and we were figuring out that, OK, so there's this spread, this spread happening with proximity and people are sitting in, in small theaters and, 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 and they're close to each other. And, and there was a lot of trying to figure it out. But you know, in Florida, they pushed those those shows pretty late all the way into March. And then in March, we, you know, stopped where those those shows ended early. And then my wife and I went to New Mexico and um, my wife, Danielle, and um, and we were there for two months. And then I uh, helped helped fix up a boat and move and, and sail it for two months. And then when I got back, the I or actually while I was on the boat, um, I started to get questions like, "You use Isadora and you you do projection design. Is there any way you could help us do remote theater? Is there any way we could bring people together from their homes and make that into something that then could get streamed out?" And and it was a big question. And and it, the first the first one of those was came from Salisbury University where they needed to, to have their theater students continue to learn how to do what they do. They needed to have their students continue to, to act and continue to work. And yet they couldn't, they couldn't bring an audience. And it was, it's, it's sort of hard for the traditional theatrical program to figure out what to do in that situation. And so we start, we started to put together a plan and uh, oh, Jesse, <laughs> um, and um, and uh, and I um, I did not um, I did not know how to do what they were asking me to do, which I was honest about. But I did know that I would figure it out, and um, and so um, and I did not know that first show how incredibly complicated my life was about to become. Uh, so, and I think there'll be more questions about this. I don't want to take the whole time 
but I will, I do hope that we can talk more about this show because it was, um, it was massive. I'll just say really quickly, 10 performers that were all uh, in different places brought together through Zoom. Um, and then a third of the way through, there was a, <laughs> there was a lottery that changed what five of the performers would be, would perform. So I had to route what, where those cameras went and we pushed the envelope and, and barely made it through, but I learned a lot. And then a few months later I found office hours, but anyway, Aaron. So I'm really curious about your entry into the whole thing into a theater in the first place. Like what, where, where did your motivation come from? Where did, did you do it in school, like high school or, you know, where, yeah. how did yeah. that yeah, happen? So, Early, early on, I, um, uh, I, I grew up in New Mexico and there's some pretty incredible sunsets in New Mexico. So that was, that was a, that was a, a gateway drug. Um, and then, and then from there, um, I, there were a couple of pivotal moments for me when I was at Chaco Canyon one time and I saw, I saw the Canyon and then the purple sky is after the sun had come down, come, come down. And I said, I want to capture that. I want to take a picture of that. How do I, how do I do that? And then I started to think about, you know, more photography. Then in high school, ninth grade, um, science teacher was telling me, was talking about the speed of light. And I went into full daydream mode and started to design, design this box with mirrors pointing inwards because I wanted to be able to hold this fast thing of light in my hands, which I knew it was kind of wacky because, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to see it, but I just wanted to, I wanted to hold it. I wanted to harness it. I mean, I guess both of those things are about harnessing it, but I didn't really understand connection yet. Um, and so um, that day, Science fair science teacher said we need to fit you need to figure out a science fair project. So I posited this daydream to him, thinking he was going to laugh me out of the room. And he said, Well, that's very interesting. And he and he said, you know, mirrors are only the best mirrors are only 98% perfect. And so the the eight percent of absorption that would happen as the light is bouncing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth would absorb all the light before you could turn the source off. And again, my mind just went. Poof. And so then I, um, I went, he said, but we can figure this out. And he dragged me over to the chemistry teacher. This guy was a physics teacher. He had written a book, Jay, Jay Shelton. He had written a book on, on how, how to best make a, how to best make a, um, how to, how to best burn things like the, the stoichiometric ratios. He was a super brilliant dude. So he dragged me over to the, to the chemistry guy and he was like, so what do you think we could do that would flash a bit of light fast enough that we, that we, we know how long it flashes. And then we have a detector to know how, how long it took for the mirrors to absorb without all that light, which was, you know, starting to take a detour of what I was trying to do, but I was still like, Ooh, cool, 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 cool. And, and then at one point I went, this stuff is really fast. And I looked at him, I said, I said, how on earth could anybody have ever measured this? And his eyebrow went up and he went, I don't know. Why don't you figure that out? And I, and so then he like kicked me into the back room. And when he did that, he said, there's some stuff back there. And I found, I found some gear and some, some detectors and a laser. And so I, I, figured out how to make a, an experiment that would work to try to measure speed of light with varied success. But the point was I was hooked. And then the next, and then the next course of action, how did that, how did I get from, from the science teacher to the, to the theater is I took a, uh, uh, stagecraft class and everybody wanted to build sets. Nobody wanted to light anything. And I was like, excellent. So, I started to do that. And then I, uh, and then I moved, uh, I moved high schools, didn't have a theater and the theater, um, they, but they taught 
acting, which I have never once wanted to be on stage. Um, and so they, they taught, they were going to teach a, a play. And I went to the, to the people who came and I said, I don't want to be on stage. I said, if we're going to do a show, I'll, I'll, I'll help with the lighting. And they said, oh, that's interesting. We're technical theater students from the College of Santa Fe. And so they invited me to come over whenever I had spare time and work with them at the theater at the college, which is what really got me going. Um, so, yeah. Next question. As we ask the next, next question, maybe we should uh, welcome our, our new panelist, Jessica Lopez Barkle. Hey, Jessica. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and let me just say that's Talak's big sister. And uh, she means a lot to him. And so I reached out to her. I just wanted to make sure she was here. And so I did something that I normally don't do. And I brought her up because. I know that she is important to him and he is important to her. And so I just, I Thank had you, to do Tony. that. It's wonderful. It's good to see you, Jesse. <laughs> wonderful. You, even though he didn't do a mic check on me. That's okay. We can do one right now. Just talk for us. Let us hear your voice just for a minute, Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica. Hi. I am. Uh, if you got any more gain, you can give it to us because we're ready to yeah. receive it from you. Do you like Jesse or Jessica best? Uh, everybody calls me by whatever because that many people care about their monikers and I don't. So. <laughs> got you. We can still <laughs> use just, just a little bit more, Jessica. <laughs> just a little bit more. Is that better? It's that's that's bit, great. It's a little yeah, bit better. Sorry, I uh, have been downgraded to my 2011 computer only and uh, it gets a lot of um, feedback and whatnot. So I have a tendency to turn things down. Got you. Got you. Well, I think with your headphones, you're safe with us. Well, we're, we're kind. Um, next question. Here goes. John Idelson from, I don't know, from Monterey, California, um, mm -hmm. asks, Tlaloc, do you think your that the performances you worked on this year will have a long-term impact on how operas and live theaters will be created and presented in the future? Yeah, I think that um, not, not I, I would I would adjust it by saying not the ones necessarily specifically that I worked on, but as a whole, this group of human beings that we call the theater art artists have banded together in order to continue to create. And um, and I and I'm hoping and I think that what has come of it is that they um one have been seen by some of the other part of the world, uh, by the broadcast part of the world, as being scrappy and having something to offer, and um, and then on the other side of it is the administrative part parts of theater companies understanding that by pulling the work outside of the room, there's there's a potential to 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 show it to more people and to move more people and to maybe w bring more interest in coming to back to that room. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you to lock for that. Next question. And just as we go to the next question, Tony, I want to tell you that, uh, that Jessica has a fun lab for Tladok's name. So maybe that's something we can save till a little bit later and, uh, <laughs> And uh, and have 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 uh, have fun with that. That'll be great. Jessica, All right. oh, Jessica is, is the, Jessica, Jessica is a teacher of voice, speech, and international. Um, what is it called? Uh, IPA uh, phonetics. Phonetics. Yeah. Like so, no better person. No better person. So that's fantastic. All right. So um, uh, Eric Hall asks. I am still trying to convince local theater and performing arts groups to do live streaming. How can I convince them that there is still a way to sell the show? Okay, well, there's a couple of things. Um, there are some services that are that are kind of locked into the theater world because there are certain publishers of, of musicals and certain publishers of plays that only allow for um, the ticketing service to be, for example, show ticks for you, 
Um, and, and so you, you're contractually obligated. And so you can charge for your streaming piece, pieces. You can charge for, for the work that is being done. Because the truth of the matter is, just because it's on a screen doesn't mean it's free. I know that we've been taught that by the advertising model, but that is not the truth. It takes a lot of work and people have and people work hard and and they put their livelihoods into this. So um, uh, I don't think and I would ask for all of you that are listening to not anticipate a play being free if you're going to go watch it. So um, I so I would say I would say kind of to the can you repeat the question or is it already been is it already gone? Because I, I think it's important. I think I can I think, certainly get back to it. It's a, I agree. It's such yeah. an important question. I'll read it again for you. Um, I'm still trying to convince local theater and performing arts groups to to do live streaming. How can I convince them that there is still a way to sell the show? The well, sell is in quotes. So so yeah. it's, I've, I've, well, I've I well I think I think what I think the answer is that you you flip it on the on its head and say let's sell the show. And, 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 and surprise them in the fact that, you know, they think as well as everyone else that what we're doing is trying to give, give this out for free, flip it on their head and sell it. Right on, right on. Okay, going to the next question, Tony. Uh, wait a second, we've got wait, Jeff Francis who has something yeah, to say. Go ahead, Jeff. I would just add into that, that the, the streaming production needs to have the artistic intent of the whatever musical theater, play, opera, whatever it is at, at heart. You know, so it's a team effort with the, the director of the show. Um, and I think that's part of the fear of some organization is they, they've seen bad streaming. And so they want to ensure that they're presented in the best light. And that comes from, and it's not exactly the same thing. You know, the direction may need to take that into account that it's coming through a screen rather than to an audience in seats. So, uh, so a team effort between the director and the live streaming director or camera. Yeah, and there's, there's been a, there's been a continuum, Jeff, of what we've done this past year. I've done things where we have a theater and there's no audience and we have five, six cameras or four cameras and we switch and we stream, you know, that's one thing that can happen. That's what the Met has made a lot of money on, you know, over the, the Met opera has made a lot of money on over the years is, 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 is bringing those, bringing those experiences to the movie theaters. And that can happen. The, the other side of it is when you don't use the theater space at all. And when that's the case, um, people are not used to that yet. So we have to, show them how to enjoy it and i think it's still it's a pro it's a, it's it's a work in progress yeah Jessica. i think for for eric's question about I'm local sorry. groups that that you team with the production that they they understand that they are going to be seen the way they want to be seen you know, you're not just dropping a camera in the back of the theater you have multiple cameras and you can follow the action as it's meant to be presented jessica go ahead I was going to add as well that it, there is a bit of Adrian Marie Brown's emergent strategy work in this idea of creating access and equity that I think we can also lean into because there's some transformational justice that has happened that Andy brought up in his, his conversations with Tony Mobley and this idea that 20,000 people showed up virtually to watch the Moliere in the park, in addition to the 200 people that were sitting in front of them. And also that the there were more BIPOC productions in off Broadway that were streamed that are moving forth because they got that audience and that access. I do see that there is a big, you know, uh, there's there's a hurdle to learn all of the technology. I, I you know, I was on the ground floor with that you know I was, I was in 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 the battle grounds with Lalo without him I think I would have fallen completely apart but that I think we really should be discussing this as a whole in live performance of having that opportunity to be there and I think we will move forth with that I agree with Andy and Lalo on that thank you Jessica for that 
Next question, Todd. This sounds like it might be a perfect segue, this last question, into, <laughs> uh, into Tony's question about your tools. And uh, the question reads, your virtual learning and production toolkit includes Zoom OSC, Isadora. Please share some of those and some others that you use. Yeah, so uh, Isadora has been a tool that uh, that I have been using for twelve plus years, and 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 I I have used it in in the moments of of need, um, and and trying to do something that nothing else can do. So it, it it's a big open slate, and I've um, I think it's the kind of thing that can be that was very intimidating to me when I first opened it up, but then I just kept banging the stick, you know, over and over and over and over again. And now it, it, it flows out of me in a way that no one else can read as some of you have noticed, but, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it's a very important tool. And I, I, I would, I would highly recommend that people um, who, who might be interested in that kind of tool to look at Troika tronics.com, which is where you can purchase it. You can download a trial. You can look at the forums. There's a huge community of really wonderful people doing amazing work, and 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 it's being pushed a lot by this community and other communities uh, in the broadcast world now, which is a really fascinating and wonderful turn of events. Because I've always wondered why there was such a separation there. So to see this come together is really great. Um, uh, Zoom OSC, um, as some of you know. Andy Carluccio was on conversations with Tony Mobley um, um, in the previous episode. Go check that out. Um, the heart that he brings to his work is is it is awe inspiring, and I think that um, that 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 I wish that every single tool that I use and put my hands on had that kind of heart in it. And um, and he he also. Um, he built that. So what that is, is, is a way to manipulate Zoom, work with it, make things happen. And, and the reason that that's important for the theater world is that we don't always have larger, more expensive tools like, you know, that, that, that just surpass the budget. And what this allows us to do is use a, a ubiquitous tool like Zoom and, and, now make it more malleable for us so we can so we can move it around and 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 quick way on a in a queued on a queued basis um he's now coming out with zoom iso i haven't used that in a theater show yet i imagine that that's that i will <laughs> um and he also makes stream weaver which is a way to send control control packets across the wider, the wider network. And this was super, super important to the shows that I did because I literally was sending an OSC packet to people's homes to switch their cameras. And I was sending an ArtNet packet to people's homes to turn on and off their, um, their, their, their lights. Um, a huge, huge, huge important tool is, uh, is, a, is a tool called OBS.ninja um, where you can send uh, you can send video across across the internet as well in in ways that sometimes are a little bit more usable than the Zoom structure. Um, and uh, QLab, hugely important for all kinds of reasons for for sound, for um, video, for for sequencing. Um, the whole ETC, the whole ET. I mean, I'm a lighting designer. So probably a little biased, but I, I like how ETC opened portions of its, of its uh, operating system so that you could send in OSC commands, you could send in MIDI commands, you can connect all of these different tools together so that they all work together in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a harmony. Did you have a question, Aaron? I can't click buttons. Um... I wanted to say two things. Looking at your Isadora patches is like looking at your brain. <laughs> I can see how you think, which is brilliant. <laughs> like that's 
it's beautiful. Like it's like a little chaotic, but you can definitely see the gist of what it is. And like, you could see the intention and in every little thing you did. So that's wonderful. And yeah, I also was wondering, like, have you seen the technical aspects of your job uh, become more melded with the creative aspects uh, over time? Like, is it one thing now, as opposed to I had to do tech stuff and then I also got to make drawings and do design? It's been, um, it's been, it's been melted the whole time. I think, I mean, well, early, early on the, the story I told about how things started, I think it started with tech, but it turned so quickly into, into this thing where I, through the, the art and the collaboration, collaboration is huge in this, in this world, through that collaboration and starting to learn from other people about what the world of theater was because I didn't really know. And I, and, and then, and then through an internship at the, at the Berlin opera, starting to learn about what the opera world was about and what the music world was about. I realized that that original desire to capture light in those two ways was encompassed in the, in the process of using light to tell a story. So I realized that it took me a while. I'm, I'm dense. I asked my dad once, I said, how am I going to be happy? Because I like to do something different every day. And he looked at me and he goes, well, that's easy. Find something that changes all the time. And it took me two years to realize that I was already doing it. It took me two years to, to realize that this theater world and this performative world and this art world, you make something, and you tear it down and you make something and you tear it down and you make something and tear it down. And, and so, and it's never the same, even if it's the same show, it's never the same. So I get a lot of reward and a lot of joy and a lot of learning out of that process, out of building and, and tearing down. I, I want to say, um, Thank you to log so much for that. And, and Jessica's going to help me get it, get it together. <laughs> um, it's, it's been, things are being shared in the chat that I think is important for the YouTube members to, uh, watchers to know. So the links on everything that he is sharing with us tonight will be in YouTube. So we have the benefit of seeing it the links being put in, but I want you to know that someone asked the question, what is Isadora? What is QLab? And so those, those links will be in the, the, the finished YouTube. So you'll be able to click on those and get more information about those. And so I just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware that, you know, it's just not going to be here. You're going to be able to see it later on if you have questions. And so Todd, the next question. Surely. Um, let's see, which one, which one? Can, may I ask a question myself just real quick? Sure, absolutely. Uh, is, it, is that like, you know, question or privilege maybe uh, to go ahead and do that? Tlaloc, so I saw a couple things fly through in the chat, which said, what is Isadora? And I would be interested to hear a quick, I don't know, sure. visual absolutely. description of what you might do with Isadora on a stage that people might have seen or might not have seen, but would be okay. kind of fantastical. Yeah. So let me get it set up. <laughs> um, oh my second. God. I wasn't saying a lab. I was just asking for a description. <laughs> um, it's not a lab. I'm just going to show you a picture that will help describe what, um, what you're asking. Uh, and I, and I have it, I have it uh, ready. I oh, almost that's so cool. Okay, so um, let's see. Here we go. So tell me if you you guys can see this, yeah? And you're a spotlight. Oh, we can't see it yet. Oh, I didn't trans. There we go. There we go. Didn't transition. So okay. So what would happen in where where Isadora is? It, the way that I used Isadora first was as a projection design media server. Mark, the creator of Isadora, calls it a creativity server because it doesn't just stop at projections. It's, it, it, it does other things like move motors and, 
and you can put a button on stage and have have that information come in and do something to a, up to to a video output. But here, what I've done in this in this this is a production of um, it's it's coming in backwards to me because Zoom is crazy. But do you guys see this? Does it say Marco uh, uh, Ruffalo to you? Ruffalo to you? Fine. Okay, yes, okay good. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so I am able to literally map the projection uh, uh, to, for example, the little stair steps in the back of this set, and I can put I can put the images anywhere on stage and literally move them around to work for what we need to the storytelling we need to do this show i did not do the lighting on i just did the projection design on and um and and so uh you know it's and and that and that i want to going off topic here for a second todd i apologize but that i want to talk about is the the collaboration at the tech table is what is the most wonderful thing about this it's not the lights it's not the it's not the projectors. It's not the Isadoras. It's the moment when I can look at my colleagues and say, well, what if we took this like this in order to tell this particular story in this way and make this feeling happen? And they look at me and go, you're crazy. It should be blue. You know, that moment <laughs> is what I live for. And so I was, and, and this show was great because I, the lighting designer was somebody I went to grad school to, with and, and the vocabulary, this happens with, with Jesse, Jessica Lopez Barkle, who's here. The vocabulary, because we went to school together, the vocabulary that's fundamental in what we talk about is there. So you don't have to translate. And I love those moments. But Isadora would allow me to play back the um, the the video the video of, of of the ocean that you see there. The 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 the, uh, the Mario uh, Rupolo gets drawn out, and so I I did that in, in After Effects, and you know it's it's like he's writing because it's all about poetry and Pablo Neruda and stuff like that. So mm. you can just do much of this playback, and 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 it, you can cue it all out and have it connected to the light board, and and so that's what that is. That's what Isadora is. Isadora can also do things like send an OSC command to Zoom OSC in order to make a Zoom uh, uh, make make a person on zoom become pinned in the, or, or spotlit in, in the meeting, you know, you can just do so many things with it. And that's why it's always a little bit hard when people ask what is Isadora because Isadora is deeply a blank slate <laughs> and you can do so much with it. And there's, there's all these different tools and it's nodal. It's a node based editor so that you can essentially draw lines between different tools to make things come in change, turn black and white, and then output kind of thing. So. Thank you so much for that. That's thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I just want to mention too, um, I, I think it's important for um, for us to recognize, and this is, so this is just a, a little comment for um, Houses of Worship. And so um, I work with a, a, a congregation that likes to do skits. And so what I want to point out is that these, these software packages that have been mentioned tonight, you might want to consider looking them up so that they may be helpful in your worship services, as well as um, any production that you might want to produce. I just wanted to make sure that that was, that was mentioned. Uh, next question. Yes, sir. How this is a we'll, we'll go a little personal here now. Tlaloc. How did you and Tony Mobley become friends? Well, um, we many of us um, are uh, uh, practitioners <laughs> of office hours and um, office hours is a group that um, that is comes together and started to come together at the, at the top of the pandemic and talk about um, audiovisual technologies, as well as it, it crept into theater and, and other things because of Andy Carluccio and others. Um, but really, we, we are all deeply curious people who have come together to, to, to figure things out, um, mostly in the, tech, in the technical side of things. And um, there was a, uh, 
lab tutorial that that came through office hours with zoom osc and i had been using it and i remember hearing tony kind of go well what is this thing and i don't quite get it and i was i was you'll note you'll note i'm constantly on the road i'm on the road right now but um i was in some hotel room and i i asked tony if he wanted to work on it a little bit and because we were all trying everybody was trying to help everybody was trying to help each other and that's sort of the mo is you know this is fun he can't figure it out maybe i can you know that kind of stuff so um so we uh so but 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 i i sat with tony and tony was so diligent and working at it and and trying to understand it and then super excited when he was able to to mute and unmute the zoom the zoom from uh, his ipad and um and it was it was just a wonderful moment and i realized that you know I could hang. I could hang with this guy. So <laughs> and then and then and then I should say that's not the end of the story, right? I mean, the next thing was we we worked on a, another lab with uh with for uh Raspberry Pi. And I I I I felt very strongly that Tony should be able to succeed at that project. And um and then we got to talking and then we got Got to talking more and then we got to talking about um a project that he was thinking about doing and i i i wanted to help so yeah, am i missing anything tony yes you're missing a lot but um <laughs> but 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 it's okay and and, and i, I want to say so careful this, tony um, you're 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 coming real close to that mic sometimes okay <laughs> and this is this is uh um I, i'm having to get used to this so uh, i'm going to be real brief with this but um there are times when um you encounter a spirit and i'm not going to get real religious about this but there are times when like souls come into contact with one another and they um, connect on the level where they are able to occasionally bump heads, but it's, it's a good kind of bumping. And so we don't agree on everything. We agree on a lot, but I have to say that he has demonstrated to me that um, we have a friendship, even though we've never actually met in person. I feel as close to him as I I do with any friend that I have. Um, and I think that we are at a point where we will do whatever we can for each other. And uh, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy to be in that space with him. And um, I'm thankful for his wife to share him, not just with me, but with the, the office hours community. Because one of the things that is unique about him is that there is not a component or a group or a section of office hours that has not benefited from his interaction. And I can say that without reservation because I know that it's true. A lot of times I'm trying to get some help from him and he has made a commitment to another group in office hours that he has to help. <laughs> and so I know for a fact that that, that is, that is part of who he is. And that is part in part why we're having this conversation tonight, because although we're talking about Zoom, um, OSC and there's a door and Q labs and, and the theater and, and all of those things that we're talking about, I thought it was important for you guys, for YouTube, for, for Zoom, for whoever may watch this in the future, to get some insight into who this person is. He is a special person. 
and he is worthy of getting to know. And so maybe you may not get to know him live in this conversation, but you will have an opportunity to, to watch and listen to him later. Um, part of, of this whole journey with conversation with Tony Mobley is not about me. It's not about, about my friend. It's about the fact that people, wherever they are, can connect and talk to one another. And that's what this is all about. That is, it's not about me. It's not about the ego. It's not about anything other than people who ordinarily would not have an opportunity to interact. Because think about it like this. Had it not been for COVID, he and I would have never met. And most of you who are here would not have met each other. Office hours probably wouldn't exist, at least not in the form that it does right now. Um, we've had some great conversations in the past, and I'm looking forward to more conversations. And we have people all over the world who are participating in this conversation tonight. And so I wanted you guys to meet my special friend because I think he's a friend that everyone should get to know and have as a friend. So I know I can go on. I'm going to stop. Um, I thought I saw Todd, did I see your hand up? Okay. And so um, I, I just wanted you guys to, to meet my special friend. Um, and um, he is a new brother for me. I, I have, there are seven of us but I, I've added an, an eighth. And so, um, and that's the way I feel about him. What so, an honor. Thank you, Tony. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking and we're going to go to the next question, unless someone has something to say, because I'm not looking at the gallery right now. So I, I couldn't see. Nobody okay, has so their hand gonna... up right, right now. And, and if you let everybody talk about Tlaloc, then we'll be here all night because we're all going to pile on what you just said. So we need to keep it. It's, it's okay. I'll just go to the okay. next question, Tony. All Is right. Okay. All right. Next question. Okay. So here's an interesting one that I find super interesting. And I wonder if you have an answer for it, Tlaloc. The question is from Eric Hall, and he asks, how or where can I learn what it takes to plan the cuts like the Met Opera does for the live streaming streaming events? It's like, where, mm. where, would, uh, where would somebody like us learn? some of this stuff. That so um, it's a really, that's an excellent question. So um, I think what you're asking is how do I learn how to cut an opera you know, in, in, in terms of video, video edit, essentially live video editing. And um, the thing, the thing is, is you got to start to learn the music. You've got to live, breathe the music. And it, it's, it's similar to lighting design in the sense that, you know, what, when, it's very similar to lighting design because lighting, theatrical lighting design is doing what you're doing at the switcher in the room. It's, it's showing you where to look for how long and how to feel about it. <laughs> Maybe that's a little much, but, um, uh, but, 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 the, but the, the switcher needs to breathe with the music so that you're not only just saying what to look at, but how to get there. And if, if the music has, you know, a certain rhythm to it or a certain, a certain timbre to it, it should, it should feel that way. And I'm not talking about a bunch of slow transitions. I'm talking about also when it happens. And really that's why I say being married to a stage manager that the lighting designer is, is, is only half the design. The, the stage manager is the rest because the stage manager places and knows that music and, and that rehearsal and everything so well that they can put the, put those move movements, put those things right in the right spot. And, and so as a designer, I try to keep up with the knowledge of the music and put those things in the right place. And then I give them to stage manager and a really good one will not call them where I've asked them to call them. They'll call them where it's right. And, um, and so 
that's that's my answer for that is is listen that's a great answer. go ahead jeff as you're planning and designing um do you work do you work from a score do you read music yeah do you make your notes in there and follow that yeah what i do is so i don't read i read music i read i understand the way that the that the page works i don't necessarily hear it by by reading it i just understand the structure of it and so what i do is i go in because a lot of times these operas are super fast turnarounds you come in you watch the last rehearsal in the in the rehearsal room and then you have maybe three days to make the show you know uh, or in, in in a bad scenario it's three days and in a better scenario it might be a couple of weeks very rarely is it a couple of weeks but um uh so so what i what i have done because of that fast turnaround is i i made an all call about six years ago to to people who might know how to program and I asked for a program to take my cue list that I listen. So while, you know, I'll, I'll start with one ahead of getting to the, to the rehearsal room, but really I make that cue list listening to the, to the music and watching the rehearsal and feeling the energy in the room. And then I, I follow along the score and then I put into a, into a sheet with score notation, like page measure system, system measure. And then I, I use the program that David Orlando made to turn it into an ASCII file that can go into the light board. So now all the light cues without any light changes in them are in the board that I want at, you know, the moments that, that, that changes happen with those score notations in them. And then I, um, uh, and then I, I usually use Google Sheets for that for that list and i share that with the stage manager so that they can then start putting them in the, in the book and then that first night you know the first piano tech even if there's no lighting she's starting or he's starting to call the show already and i can work along with it and have and and, and be um be very uh you know ex expeditious you know and move quickly um there's a question in chat about aren't you dependent upon the tempo of the conductor yes this is why to all people who set up set up shows for operas, there needs to be a conductor cam and there needs to be a monitor at the stage manager's desk. Abso absolutely. I don't think people outside of it understand how much the stage manager runs the show. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, this goes for Broadway too. So it's, you know, I always, I always think of the stage manager as being the conductor of the ensemble on stage. She makes it all happen. And backstage. And backstage, <laughs> especially back more backstage than on stage, right? Removal of chaos. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Shall we move on to the next question? Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, please. <laughs> um, so here from, from one of our Office Hours members, James Foslian. <clears throat> I'm going to try to interpret this because I think there might be one letter missing. I reread your decree to think of diversity as a point of contrast. Can you talk about what diversity means to you? Um, that's interesting. Diversity is life. You know, if, if we don't have diversity of so many things, diversity of, of thought, diversity of understanding, diversity of background, diversity of, of all those things, then there is no movement away from that which is comfortable. And if we don't move away from that which is comfortable, we don't we don't move. We don't move. I mean, there's just no, there's no, there's no work that can happen within ourselves. Cause the truth of the matter is you don't, you don't have to work on the people around you. If they, if, if, if they, if they annoy you, if they, if you like them, whatever it is, you don't have to work on them. You have to work on you. And the best way for that to happen is for there to be a 
diversity of thought and diversity of background and diversity of experience so that you come up against that which doesn't seem to be quite right and you check yourself and you go, well, why is it that I see this as wrong? Where does it come from? How is it that that happened? Let me ask some questions. Let me ask some questions. Let me ask where something, where an idea and where a thought was, was, was created. And, and invariably what happens is you realize that you're missing the boat. And so it's a beautiful thing, you know, embrace it. And, and so that's, that's kind of, I, I love the question because I, I didn't even think about it. I was thinking about a sort of a technical aesthetic idea. And, uh, but in, in, in a way, that's exactly the same. It's exactly the point uh, of contrast equals interest because where there is, where there is uh, differentness, there is learning. Absolutely. Jessica? Yeah, I just wanted to say as someone who has collaborated with Lalok for a long time and has known him since I was 19 years old, and I won't say how old I am now, but <laughs> I'm in my 40s, so it's been a while. Um, it is the joy to watch him lean into what is the fundamental being that he is. And he is an intersection of cultures and diversity from birth. And when, like, for example, one time we were like a very quick show with some Japanese artists and some children from Cambodia, we were opening our theater with it. It had four tons of sand and a variety of other things. <laughs> it barely got the theater um, in stable and a variety of other things and we were both angry tired had not slept and um but it was amazing this this moment when Komo-san and Eko-san leaned into him and said oh I really like this color that you changed it to and you just saw him as tired as he was gets you know because he loves a conversation you know I think I love that Toby Toby <laughs> Tony uh, I wanted to like make your name Tobly uh Tony's it's conversations with, it's exactly what Tlaloc looks forward to. And he, no matter how tired he is, he wants to have that diverse conversation. It is who he is as a human being, but it is who he is it, as a designer, as a, you know, it, it, that's how he looks at it. And it has to be diverse and he will love that conversation so that it can become something else and grow from there. Yeah, yes, I, I think, I, I'm sorry, I, go ahead. I think that it, it it's really, really an amazing thing to watch a design meeting where everybody goes and reads the script. Everybody goes and listens to the opera. Everybody, you know, comes in with, with, with all these different ideas and the, the successful ones, you result in something that not one of us brought to the table. And I mean, what is alchemy if not that? I, I, I just wanted to, to add that I, I think, um, and I don't know if it's appropriate now to, to ask this of you, but I think that your, your parentage makes you uh, unique in the way that you can see a lot of different things. And so if, if it's okay, if you don't mind just sharing a bit of, of that right now. Yeah. Um, my, my father is, is Mexican American from the Southern tip of Texas, uh, about three miles from the border of Mexico. And, um, and my mother came to the United States when she was 30, uh, from Germany and, um, they met at a yogurt stand. <laughs> And, um, and, uh, and there, there is, a, there is some deeply unique things about my parents. Um, and, uh, my mom passed away in 2006, but there are some deeply, deeply unique things about both of them. And that is that they, um, are people who wanted to understand what lies deeply within themselves. And 
And so, um, and everything, their whole life's work, which I'm not going to get completely into, was was about well, my my dad, my dad's first, and he he sort of taught my dad, my mom, you know, it, it, it's sort of a, a psychological psychological work that they were doing, but it it always was about understanding that which is oneself and that which is what um, somebody aspires to do and the continuum between that and how you need to find balance between those two sides of, of yourself. And so add that to the fact that they fought like cats and dogs because they were <laughs> because they were of different cultures and they had to under, they had to go through that process. It meant that I always was taught by circumstance and by specific, specific intent. I was always taught that one should understand that everybody thinks differently and that you need to figure out where things are coming from and why things are coming from. And, um, and then you can actually grow, but you know, I, I don't, I don't want to be, that's not, that's not what everybody feels. And I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not prescribing that for people. It's just the way that I feel. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Next question. Ironically, I was about to ask the question about specific things that your parents taught you that you're still embracing, but I think you just, you just uh, covered that all in there, Tlaloc. So thanks for that. Here's some, um, Here's another one. How did COVID-19 affect your industry, your theater working industry in general from Tony Mobley? Well, it started out with, with, with a bit of a bloodbath, you know, um, people did not know what the train that had just hit them. And so there was resistance. There was, there was thoughts of, of, Oh, it'll be okay. You know, there was, um, thoughts of, oh, this is, this is the end of the world and we're going to have to shut down. And, and so everybody had to really work on figuring out how to, to continue. Um, and hard conversations were, were being had. There were, there were um, indications from, from the, the safety officers of the unions about, about not continuing. There, you know, there were there were a lot of differing differing opinions about how how to make it through and what to do and what the right thing to do was. And I don't think that that's changed at all. Actually, I think we're still working through that. And so um, we all at we all just had to um, rethink some things. And in that way, I think it was, it was good because I think there was a lot of things that needed to be rethought and the rethinking is not all what I want it to be or where I want it to go. But I think the rethinking had to be done nevertheless, no matter what the outcome is. Cause it's not like rethink and then you'll do what I want you to do. That's not what I mean. Rethink all of us, me included. How is this, is this, is this a sustainable career? Is this the kind of thing that you're that you're, that is, 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 a, is treating people right. And I think there was a lot of that soul searching that has happened in this whole industry and some that hasn't, <laughs> but we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next question. This is a question from our friend, our mutual friend, Hasmuk Gajar. And uh, if for those of you watching, uh, Hasmuk and his, his wife, Damyanti Gajar, have done a cooking show together that uh, Tlaloc really supported them in lighting recently. And uh, Hasmuk asks, Tlaloc, having spent much time with us in lighting and shading cameras, do you have suggestions for how the cooking show could improve visually? Um, my, uh, I had so much fun with that and, um, I hope to do it again, but, um, my, my thoughts was it would be really fun to pick out, um, some things in the background in the, in the kitchen, because, you know, 
what was it? What was it? Contrast equals interest. So, um, <laughs> so I, I'd like to find some interesting things in the background to, to pop forward a little bit, um, because, um, it'll, it'll, I think it'll make, it'll make for a really, um, dynamic, uh, visual. Um, I think we need to shade the cameras with a little bit more than half an hour time uh, again. Uh, there's a story behind that. We'll get into that later at some point. But anyway, uh, uh, but but yeah, I think I think I think along those lines, um, pulling out things of interest that are important and have meaning. And I, I I do think it's important to mention that our good friend Hasmuk is in Cape Town, South Africa. And it is uh, 4 a.m. for him, and he has been here. And so uh, I just wanted to mention that. And not only that, he was the very first guest on Conversations with Tony Mobley. Indeed. Next I question. Be, because we might have uh, have a few folks who, who might not know Hasbuk and Damianti, uh, I asked Aaron to grab a a screenshot of their show or, or, a, or a YouTube link so we can share it with the rest of our, of our uh, cohort here, if that's okay, Tony. There we go. That is okay. Here, let me, uh, let me just spotlight that for everybody. This is Damianti Gajar and uh, a chef, uh, the writer of a beautiful, beautiful <coughs> photo, beautifully photographed book uh, and so on. So this is what we're talking about. I always like to try to show show what we're talking about to anybody who might not have seen it. So they have, uh, have a chance to understand that. Thank you so much, Aaron. Now Thank you, Aaron. To remove spotlight. There we go. This is my first time ever cutting a show, trying to cut a show a little bit while, while asking questions. Um, here's a great one for Tlaloc. What about your work brings you the greatest joy? Did we lose him? Must be those quiet moments. Uh, I think he he'll be back. Not he'll be back. Moment. I'm sure he'll be back. Yeah. Yeah, he'll be back. So while while we're waiting for him to come back, um, I, I I think it's important for us to to um, to know as a community that. Um, we're going to continue to um, work toward. Oh, sh absolutely, Jessica. <laughs> Jessica is going to. Uh, be before you before you say anything, Jessica. Let me just make this one attempt before you before you uh, start my training. <laughs> Wallach. No. Yeah, that's close. You're getting there. Um, okay. But I have I have one. So do you sing? I, I'm a background singer. OK, so you sang, <laughs> so you've sang law, right? So la, law, law. So, and when we sing, we make a beautiful ah sound like they do in any Latin language. So we have that ah and that that la. that accent on Tlaloc's name is that that beautiful ah. So that's the first thing that I really ah, like. Tlaloc. And yeah, there you go. And then if you say the word little, that TL at the end of little, tl, 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 T and L put together. So just get everybody can do this along with me at home or <laughs> aloud, but tl, we can't do that in Zoom, but I, I can't help myself to want that Zoom could be faster. Tl, tl. <laughs> but where you put the TL, because that's why you were close, is behind your your top teeth is your gum ridge and you put your tongue right up there and then you let the you let the aspiration come out so cool cool because the l and cool and now yep cool cool look yep so you're gonna have the t so those are made in the exact same spot because the l is also made on your gum ridge as it as it resonates so we have that 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 aspirated T. And then you have to go to that beautiful ah. Uh, 
pla and think think pla. there there it is pla 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 lock pla lock and then lock pla pla lock lock there like tone lock pla lock yeah pla lock pla lock so much better okay hey. pla lock pla lock pla pla lock pla lock you don't, you don't have to choke. And then also we can embrace we can embrace the southern the southernness. So we have that ah that beautiful ah that we get down in the southeastern part of the country. So tla. So let la, there you la, go. Lock. La, la, lock. And then lok. La, lok. La, like, lok. Yeah, and then like tone lok from back in the nineties. So we have tla lok. La, I'm concerned that I should have stayed away a little bit longer. You did it! You did it! You did it! La lock. <laughs> you did it! La lock. Yep. And then. La lock. Yep. And then now. La And now it needs la, to. Now it needs to dance like the rain god. So it's la lock. La lock. La lock. There it is. La lock. You guys, I had a power outage. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> you did a Tony Mobley right there That's on screen. Two weeks in a row. Plalok, <laughs> I fixed him. He can do it. That's great. That's Plalok. Can we move on, please? We'll <laughs> <laughs> be doing that the rest of the night. Oh my god! I apologize, but it's such a it was such a big deal for me, and I'm <laughs> talking into the mic. I apologize for that too. Um, but it's a big deal for me. Um, and I'm just, I'm not going to apologize for the fact that it's a big deal for me. <laughs> okay. Next Tony, question. Tony, I should let you know that we're getting right to the end of our questions. Fantastic. So, uh, um, that's fine. Yeah. So, uh, the, the only question that we really have left is, do you think projection can supplant sets? Uh, mm. no. <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, projections. Um, how do I, how do I best put this? Uh, you know what? A Excuse set, me. a set, a set. Excuse yeah. me, because it, it, I, I'm now realizing that Eric Hall had put the question into kind of two separate questions, maybe hitting enter too early. So let me read that question again. Do you think projection can supplant sets to cut it to the satisfaction of the general director? That's okay. what I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I see, I see where the question is going. And here, here's the thing. A set exists without there being anything on stage. So if you can... The, prob the problem, though, is that we need to be able to make decisions about that stage, no matter whether there is stuff on it or not. So I think the answer is no, because maybe in this particular situation, the projections are the set, but it doesn't mean that you've replaced a set and it doesn't mean you, it's cheaper because it's not. Um, and, and so I, I remind you that these, this equipment is expensive and I'm expensive. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to be a little more expensive, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, I just in, 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 so far as to say that I think people assume that there is no money that needs to be spent in those, in those, in those moments. And, and the truth is that there is, and it's more than just expense in money it's expense in planning you have to think about it and have to understand that every person sitting in the seats are are going to be experiencing this thing and every decision that we make they won't notice but every decision that we don't make will be very very obvious so we have to think about it where's the masking what is what is the shape of the of the, of the psych behind behind them is there a scrim? Um, you'll find that a lot of times I'm a lighting designer with sets that are rented in, 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 in the opera world. And then I am a scenic designer and I'm making decisions about where those pieces of, of scenery go. I mean, I, I, 
the people who, who design sets would probably be mad at me saying that. I'm not the scenic designer that has designed the set that was rented, but I have to have that eye to look at where things are in this new space. Um, and so you'll see me over there going, can you move that wall five feet to the left? And I've had people go, oh, aren't you the lighting designer? Well, yes, but I need to be able to uh, work on the whole th the whole piece as a whole and make sure that it is coming across in a way that is the best. I'm kind of opinionated. Oh, well. Jessica, yes, go ahead, <laughs> Jessica. <laughs> I, I'm not going to jump in on the opinion of that, but I did want to just kind of call out another part that is quite fundamental about Tlaloc, which is our undergraduate training. He went to a very unique program at Cornish College of the Arts um, in the performance production department, which did really quite make them learn everything. And it makes him the most amazing collaborator because even, even though he made the joke that he's never, he doesn't do costume design, I bet you he could. And I've seen something he's sewn. He had to model it. Um, so it's, it, it is something that helps, but there's no way that projections could supplant sets. Uh, I, as a director, that would make me insane. Um, and he's right. It's not cheaper. There's, I can't even afford half of the stuff that he can make look pretty. So there's that. Aaron. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jessica. I'm, I'm curious about, I don't know why the word sculptor just came into my head um, as, as a lighting designer and as a sort of polymath, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm also a scenic designer um, yeah. and, um, and, and it's not just Cornish College of the Arts that allowed me to have that thinking. I don't think I, I know a lot of really much better scenic designers than me. But um, but I I was required to for the thesis at NYU to to design the whole we we all were to design the whole production and that kind of thinking is is very valuable to any of these situations and and you know and you'll you'll notice it if I'm working if if I'm working on a on a on a project that's just a zoom call. Like I think about those kinds of things kind of holistically. And, um, um, but also that's not me so much wanting to, to, to say that about myself. It's just that that's kind of what I like about it. That's what makes it fun for me um, is to be able to, to work on all of those different aspects and sitting in a, in a design meeting and saying, well, what about, how how is the orchestra going to 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 be to sound with that set in the way is that going to be a problem and, and are we going to later have to move the, the orchestra because because the because the conductor is really upset about how the sound is mixing and i i tend to at first get some looks about asking those kinds of questions but um it is uh an important part of my job so but here's here's a set design that I did. Let's see. Oops, that's the wrong thing. This was for Secret Garden, and this 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 piece um, spun around, and like there was arch choreo choreography, and most of my lighting design. I mean, most of my scene design just has a lot of practicals in it because I'm a lighting designer, but. Powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we are going to um, we're going to end the conversation on YouTube. I'm going to encourage anyone who is on YouTube to come into the Zoom meeting if you'd like. We're going to hang out for about 20, 30 minutes. Um, just kind of a relaxing conversation, continuing conversation, but a more relaxed conversation. So we're gonna we're gonna turn YouTube off. So we want to encourage you to to come into the Zoom meeting. If you want to just come in, turn your camera on, say hello. Um, 
anything you might want to do in in this, and then we'll we'll um, probably go to after hours, which is a part of office hours. After that, um, but before we go, um, we're going to do. Um, I'm going to do my special thanks. And so before I do my special thanks, I want to say to those who are on YouTube, what you have been able to see um, today was an upgrade of conversations with Tony Mobley based on the members of the office hours community and they made a decision that they wanted to impact the way in which conversation with Tony Mobley would be presented on YouTube. And this is um, production, let me say, say it this way. This is television production level efforts that are now being made for this conversation. And we will be getting better and better every week. This is also uh, this is also going to be a lab, and so if you have interest in finding out how they are doing everything that you are seeing on YouTube, um, this is this is a place to to come and participate. There are going to be opportunities to learn exactly how things are being done. And so um, our panelists did not get to see everything that has been going on, but they will get a chance to, to talk about it in the after show or after a conversation, or like I like to call it fellowship hour. And so in the fellowship hour, we'll talk about it in more detail. So let me just share with you guys. So special thanks to Kimberly Mobley, the global family and friends, Alex Lindsay, Office Hours members, DVE store, the VDO 360 company, Talak Lopez Waterman, Talak Lopez Waterman, <laughs> Ken Jordan, Chirac. Shahita, I'm sorry, Chirac, if I messed it up, Jonas Dattel, um, and Marcus, and it went away from me, so Rich, Richard uh, Lavery and Chris Fenwick. And so you guys got a chance to see the, the upgraded version of Conversations with Tony Mobley. And this is going to be building, as I've been told, that this is going to build in terms of bringing in more uh, graphics, music, it's going to continue to build as time goes by. And so I am thankful. I am extremely thankful for this community and everyone who is helping me have this conversation. Because think about it. The people who are doing this on YouTube are in Germany, Dallas, Texas. Um, South Africa, um, just all over the world. And so things are, this is a global conversation and it's a global presentation. And so I, I'm excited about being able to say that. And so at this time, we're going to go ahead in YouTube. And if I overlooked anyone uh, I apologize. Uh, I am very thankful for what conversations is becoming. I want to thank my friend so much for coming on, sharing this with me, and not only that, continuing to support me and encourage me in conversations with Tony Mobley. It means a lot to me. Uh, I don't take your support and encouragement for granted. Thank you so much for allowing all of us to just share in this conversation tonight. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. And to YouTube, good night, YouTube.